Okay, so the next talk is on permuted puzzles and cryptographic hardness, and Justin will give the talk. Right, hi. I'm Justin, and I will tell you about permuted puzzles and cryptographic hardness later. Um, right now, I'm going to talk about private information retrieval, which is the main reason that anybody should care about permuted puzzles, and it's also something I guess you've already heard about. Um, but just to, like, remind you, um, so in private information retrieval, we have... Uh, some database that's on a server and, you have, and uh, some client that wants to access this database without revealing which part of this database he's looking at. And of course the two basic requirements are that um, the client should actually get the bit of the database that he's interested in and that the, uh, the curious server should learn nothing about which bit the client is accessing. Okay, so the, in, uh, the traditional focus in private information retrieval has been on minimizing the communication um, between the client and server, like specifically trying to do better than the trivial solution where the um, server sends everything to the client. And by now we know how to do like polylogarithmic overhead or maybe even O of log, I don't know. But um, in this talk, we're gonna focus on something uh, different, which is the amount of computation that is done by the server. So there is like a trivial linear lower bound on the amount of work that the server needs to do because if it, if, uh, it doesn't touch some bit of the database then you know that the client is not looking at that bit. Still though, we're gonna try to do uh, better than that by allowing the server to do some pre-processing. That's what we would hope for. Um, and so this notion of a private information retrieval scheme where not just the client but also the server runs in sublinear time um, was termed doubly efficient private information retrieval in uh, TCC two years ago. Um, so the question is, does doubly efficient private information retrieval exist? And um, I have no idea. I don't have any candidates, and I don't know of any impossibility results. However, there is like a useful relaxation still of uh, doubly efficient peer, which uh, I guess you can think of as a secret key version of peer. Um, in this version, um, well, there's a secret key, and you need to have this secret key in order to um, process a database or to make queries to the database. Um, and privacy is guaranteed against an uh, adversary, adversary that does not have the secret key. So intuitively this corresponds to a setting where the database is actually like, owned and controlled by the client, but the client is just storing his own database on some uh, Snoopy server. <clears throat> so this notion of a secret key uh, private information retrieval scheme is actually sufficient for some applications like uh, homomorphic encryption for RAM programs. Um, okay, now the next question is, does secret key doubly efficient private information retrieval exist? I also don't really know, but I have like some more reason to think that it might exist. So um, there's basically one candidate construction that was in the same TCC papers uh, in 2017. And uh, within this, there's like sort of like one fuzzy construction. There are some ways you can play with parameters and vary it a little bit. Um, but this is a fundamentally like an ad hoc construction. It's not based on any standard cryptographic assumption. And it seems to me like it's very hard to try to construct the scheme based on a, on a standard assumption, although I don't have any formal evidence to uh, justify this. So I want to show you briefly what the candidate scheme looks like, even though it's not really the focus of this talk, sort of. Um, so the secret key is, involves a pseudorandom permutation and also an encryption key, although like, mostly we'll forget about the encryption key. So what you do is you take your database and you encode it in a locally decodable code. Specifically, we consider the locally decodable code that is uh, the read molar code. And so uh, you don't need to know what that is. So we encode the database and then we randomly permute all the entries of the database under, under this permutation pi and we encrypt each entry of the database. Now, um, say that you want to look up an entry of this database privately. So here's the, um, the scheme that we proposed. First, I'm being a little bit vague. First, you sample a low degree curve, not too low degree, but say like the degree is a security parameter, um, through the point that you're interested in, in the, in the read molar encoding of the database. Um, now, instead of just, you take some points on this curve, and you ask the server, you like permute these points yourself and you ask the server to tell you like the um, values at the permuted points. And now you just decrypt the responses that you receive and use uh, some polynomial interpolation 
which is it's just some local decoding procedure that's guaranteed by the code. You don't need to um, worry too much about that if you're not familiar with Reed Muller. Okay, so does uh, the scheme make sense to everybody? Vaguely? Okay, so um, yeah, that's like roughly the scheme. You can play with it a little bit by like um, varying how you choose the points on the curve, and you can like maybe throw in some noise too. Um, but that's that's this is basically the only scheme that we have. Okay, so to be a little bit more formal about what we want out of this scheme, I'll tell you like what the security game is. So um, again, we have a challenge and an adversary. You sample your random your random key, and now an adversary picks two different sequences of uh, queries that I might want to make. Um, if you want, you can think about these as being adaptive, but for now, like just for simplicity, let's say they're all chosen at once. Uh, the challenger like just makes the, 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 the pure queries, basically. It samples the curves that go through the specified points for like one of these two, uh, two query sequences. It permutes all these points, and the adversary then tries to guess which, uh, which of the two uh, query sequences the challenger chose. Okay. Um, so if this were to be secure, where would the computational hardness be coming from? Um, well, the, the hope is that this secret permutation is somehow adding computational hardness because we can we know we can show that if you don't have this permutation, if you just just use the identity, then the scheme is completely broken. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to look at this phenomenon a little non a little bit more, like does adding a secret permutation ever actually create computational hardness? And more specifically for our candidate construction, is this assumption plausible? Um, so for the first question, does a secret permutation ever create computational hardness? Um, well, we formalize this question a little bit better. That's what these permuted puzzles are all about if you've been waiting. Um, and this builds on uh, one of these TCC papers in 2017. And, uh, we do show that, yes, there are actually examples. You can, you can like, show that permutations create computational hardness from like, standard crypto cryptographic assumptions. Although, this won't, we can't show that the, PI, the private information retrieval scheme is secure from standard cryptographic assumptions. Just like this general phenomenon can happen. Okay. Um, and we, the, yeah, we show this based on random oracles or DDH assumption or, um, uh, Fermima showed us a very clean example of uh, something based on LPN. Um, okay, in, in this talk, I'm not going to talk about DDH. I'm just going to do everything in idealized models. Um, so on the second contribution is looking at whether or not like, actual secret key DEPR schemes are plausible. And we still don't really know, but we do rule out one very broad class of attacks, which we sort of formula formalize. Okay, so... In terms of the abstraction of our permuted puzzle, um, so in secret key deep here we have this distribution. We can think of it as a, it's like a set of points. You can think of that as being a binary string where ones indicate where you have a point. In general, we'll, we'll think about having just a bunch of distributions on m-bit strings. Um, and we wanted to say that when you permute all these points, then um, somehow stuff became indistinguishable. Right, so in the um, and by permuting, I just mean that you're taking the bits of X and you're just rearranging them. According to one permutation, you reuse the same permutation in every sample. And we wanted to say that these are, um, in these, like these permuted distributions are indistinguishable in like a pretty standard sense. You just pick two different sequences of these distributions. The challenger picks a random one of these sequences and picks a random permutation, and now it'll answer according to the like, sort of permuted distributions. Um, right, and in this talk, I'm just going to focus on uh, k equals two, where there's two choices of distributions, rather than like n different choices of distributions, just for simplicity, because that seems to capture the uh, phenomenon of the computational hardness. Okay, so that's that's like what a permuted puzzle is. You have some distributions; they're easy to distinguish. You add a random permutation, and now they're hard to distinguish. So it's um, not too hard to construct these in the random oracle model. I'll just show you the construction and assert that it's obviously a good permuted puzzle. So you have a random oracle, um, just a random function that takes inputs and puts these n-bit outputs. Um, so in each sample, 
I'm, or every time you, like, sample, I'm going to sample basically new random oracles. You can derive some random oracles by choosing a seed and like whatever. It's pretty standard. You can derive n new oracles. And the first distribution is going to be um, like a description of these n oracles and uh, like an input, and then like just apply the oracles in order, and then you get an output. Okay. And the second distribution is going to be the same thing, except at the end, instead of doing the output, you just you just the distribution just contains a uniformly random string. Okay, so just so we're on the same page, it's very easy to distinguish these two distributions, right? You just um, apply the hash functions in order and see that at the end you get the the claim value. Okay, but now if if you don't get S1 through Sn in order, if you just get them in some random order, my claim is that like, obviously in the random oracle model you can't tell whether Y is the result of applying of, of check of like computing or iteratively applying these hash functions in the correct order. Right, so I'll just say that's um, obviously true, and if you want a formal proof, you can look at the paper. <coughs> All right, um, I'll show you one more construction of a hard permuted puzzle just to give you a taste of um, what are what things look like, and it's in the generic. I'm, I'm going to argue that it's secure in the generic root model, um, but the same construction actually you can show to uh, be a hard permuted puzzle under the DDH assumption. So yeah, you have your group. Um, choose a random vector over a ZP. P is the order of your group, and now your two distributions are just two vectors of things in the exponent. Um, in the first case, every, the, the vector in the exponent is orthogonal to you. And in the second case, the things in the exponent have no relation to you whatsoever. Okay, so again, these are two distributions that you can easily distinguish just by doing an, uh, a dot product in the exponent. Right? You can check whether um, u dot the exponent is equal to zero, just linear operations. Um, uh, sorry, that's a little, I'm a little like, behind by one on my slide count. Um, okay, so on the other hand, if, if you permute these two vectors, uh, the claim is that you just can't, you can't do this simple inner product test anymore. And in the generic group model, you can actually show that these sorts of inner products in the exponent are the only thing that you can do to try to distinguish a vector of encoded group elements from random. Um, so as long as u is not, like, say, a constant vector or something close to it, um, there will be no fixed vector that you can try to do an inner product with, which will be zero with any um, noticeable probability in the exponent. Okay, so now we know that there are hard permuted puzzles. In principle, at least, permutations can make like, easily distinguishable distributions become indistinguishable. <laughs> so the next thing I wanted to talk about was how to just analyze permuted puzzles in general, like how, how to think about whether or not a specific puzzle should be computationally hard. And in particular, this is going to be motivated by our secret key deep here constructions. Okay, so um, the like, idea is, and I don't have a, like a formal statement or proof, but once you, when you have these distributions of n-bit strings and you apply a, a random permutation to each of the strings, that kills a lot of the structure of the ways in which this um, distribution, these, these strings could be non-random. Um, I will mention that it is important that I'm talking about distinguishing these strings from random. If you talk about just general distinguishability of two distributions, I can construct kind of complicated examples that I don't really know how to, how to rule out. So, um, yeah, does anybody have any good ideas for how you can what kind of structure you might look at. Oh, never mind, no talking. Um, so one, one thing you can try to look at in, um, in like a distribution after it's been permuted is something like, say, the number of bits that are still one, because that's preserved by a permutation, right? So you can, if, if um, a distribution has, is, has a Hamming weight that's distributed differently than a uniformly random string, then of course you'll be able to distinguish it even with a permutation. Um, another thing you might try to do is look for some weird correlations between bits. So maybe if you have a distribution, there's some pair of bits that are never both one, or there are just some like small number of bits that are distributed differently from uniformly random. So you can look for all for these bits. You can try all small subsets of the bits, 
And you can do this even if you have a random permutation. Okay, like one other thing, and this is the last thing I promise, that you can, I can think of that you can try to do to uh, distinguish some permuted strings from random is look for some linear structure. So for instance, say that uh, your x1, your, all your x's are contained in a, like a low dimensional subspace. Um, you don't necessarily know which one, there's just some subspace that they're contained in. You can check this uh, by just doing linear algebra, like Gaussian elimination or something. And this is also preserved if all of the samples are permuted by the same permutation. And I don't really have any other like, fundamentally different algorithmic ideas for how you can um, distinguish uh, sort of permuted puzzle thingies from random strings. Um, and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on like, a generalization of these ideas one and two. Um, called statistical query algorithms. Um, so yeah, what's a statistical query algorithm? Um, so, oh, everything appeared all at once. Okay. Um, so, I guess you can just look at the slide while I talk. But uh, given a bunch of samples from this distribution, you're trying to tell whether or not it's um, uniformly random or not, right? And so a statistical query algorithm just limits the algorithm in a a specific way where the algorithm doesn't get to directly look at the samples. Instead, it gets to look at essentially one bit per sample. So for each sample, it says it specifies a function and it gets that function applied to that sample. And it gets as many samples as it wants in this form where it just gets one bit per sample. And, um, and then at the end, it tries to use this, these one bit per sample queries to to guess whether this, this distribution is random or not. Um, and so this is, a, this is a, a, like an idealized model of learning that was introduced um, by Kearns to study uh, pack learning that's robust against noise. Um, and we kind of thought it was a neat model to, like, to study for just these distribution distinguishing problems that arise um, in deep here. Okay, so. This sounds like a really like, silly model, right? Like, if you're only looking at one bit of each sample, what can you possibly do? Um, actually, quite a lot. So in this whole field of like, robust pack learning algorithms, um, basically every single algorithm is, in, is a statistical query algorithm. Like, there were some algorithms before statistical queries were introduced, and those were later found to actually be equivalent to some statistical query algorithms. Um, there is one exception, which is the well-known BKW algorithm for um, learning parity with noise when uh, the, um, yeah, the secret is very, very short or something, like, just very slightly super logarithmic. Um, and like I said, we're, we're sort of studying statistical query algorithms in a slightly different setting than they were originally considered, but we're still able to show lower bounds, which is, um, I guess, part of why we consider them. Okay. So what can't statistical query algorithms do? Cool. Um, so one thing they can't do, which is you might laugh at, is they can't do Gaussian elimination. Like there, it's known that you can't learn parity with a statistical query algorithm, and that should that should make sense because there's this tight correlation between statistical query algorithms and noise robust learning, and we know that we can't learn parity with noise. We, we hope that we can't learn parity with noise. Um, and in this work, we show that these statistical query algorithms also cannot break. Um, like even like a toy problem in, uh, uh, that's like similar to the pure, but presumably easier to break. So what is this toy problem? Why is it different than the actual construction and why can't statistical query algorithms break it? Um, so it looks kind of similar to the setup you saw like 10 minutes ago, if you remember that at all. Um, except that instead of, for these, these polynomials, instead of, um, being these parametric polynomials that can like intersect themselves and all that, we're just looking at um, graphs of polynomials. So these are just simpler to analyze. That's the main reason that they're part of the toy problem. Simpler to think about for sure. Um, and we want to say that when you have a low degree, again, degree is a security parameter, polynomial versus a random function, uh, these distributions become indistinguishable uh, when you add a random permutation. Okay, so I'll just try to sketch why this is true, and um, then I'll be almost done. So suppose you have a function f that you're, this is going to give you your one bit about some sample. 
And also, I'm just going to make your life easier as the attacker. I'm going to say, instead of a uniformly random permutation, we're just looking at a restricted class of permutations, where you just sample each column separately, and then you sample the row. So then, you, sorry, then you permute the columns. Okay, and in order to show that, I want to show that um, your statistical query cannot give you any information. Like, so to do that, I want to say that the probability that your query is, returns a 1 doesn't even really depend on the secret permutation or like what bit the, the challenger chose. So like, with very high probability, this over the choice, yeah, yeah, basically when the challenger chooses this permutation with very high probability, this probability is very close to some fixed value. So you can simulate the result of the query by yourself. Yeah, you can simulate the query by yourself. Um, OK, so what I, like to, I want to explain why this is true. And I'm just going to show that for the distribution on the left, the variance in this probability is negligible. So the, the, the variance of, is um, equal to this quantity, right? This is just how it's defined. But if you look at this, um, have a, you look at this quantity, it's like saying you, you take a random permutation, and then you take an x, and you take another x prime, and yeah, and, and like what's the probability that f of pi of x is 1 and f of pi of x prime is 1? If you, if you like stare at this expression enough, that's what it is. And here, it's saying if you take a random permutation pi and another rand a different random permutation pi prime, an x and an x prime, um, then like, what? Well, it's the same thing. It's like, you just stare at those, those expressions enough, and it turns out that what you need to bound is the statistical distance between these two different distributions. So one is if you take two samples and you apply the same permutation, and the other distribution is you take two samples and you apply different permutations. Okay? Um, and, and then you, and you yeah, yeah, so. Um, so the, the difference between these distributions is just related to the, the size of the intersection uh, between, so when you, when you apply the same permutation to two different sets, the distribution is uniformly random, con conditioned on like those two sets having the whatever overlap they had. Whereas uh, when you do two different permutations, they're just, there's just some new distribution of like how many points they overlap on, and other than that, that distribution is also uniformly random. So what we need to prove at the end of the day to finish this bound is that the, when you take two degree lambda polynomials, you look at their graphs, and you look at how many points uh, these polynomials uh, agree on, it's the same, roughly, distribution of number of points as if you have two random functions. Um, and there's some parameters about like the field size versus the degree and stuff to make this work, but that's, that's like what we, that's like the lemma at the bottom of this statistical query lower bound. All right, that's all the technical stuff. Um, so for future directions, um, like I, I said that there are these different types of algorithms that you can use to try to break permuted puzzles, and I addressed two of them and said that those don't work. So what about the third one? Um, we want to address that, and actually in, a, in a, some work in progress, we show that this toy problem, which was like the easiest thing that we didn't know how to break before, we can actually break with a linearization, with a, some sort of linearization attack. Um, we don't know how to break the actual full schemes. But we do want to figure out what's going on with these full schemes. We can maybe attack them, maybe reduce them to standard assumptions, maybe we can formulate some sort of idealized model of like, these really are the only types of attacks that can do a permuted puzzles and show that these attacks don't work. Um, I, I sort of feel like there should be some reason that you can't reduce the standard assumptions, but I don't know how to say anything formal. So that would be cool if we could do that. Um, and finally, I still want to have a not secret key, doubly efficient peer scheme, just a keyless scheme. Um, I have no idea. It'd be really cool if we could figure out whether those exist. All right, that's it. Thank you. Questions for Justin?
Thanks. Uh, so one thing that you could consider, maybe you did already, uh, is to not just ask about the points that are on the curve, but also add some dummy points. And this intuitively is sort of like adding noise, which seems to be useful in many settings. So um, do you think this would be helpful? In particular, you have an attack on this toy problem. So does your attack work also in, on sort of a noisy version of the toy problem? Yeah, it's a great question. We're definitely thinking about the effect of noise. Um, we don't have anything definitive to say at the at moment. But yeah, like we don't, we, our attack doesn't work when you add noise. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, have you thought about other applications of these uh, assumptions? Like, are they useful for building other things? Uh, I have no other uh, applications that I'm aware of. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? Okay, let's thank Justin again.